Hello, chefs. You're listening to Chef's PSA Podcast. I'm your host, Andre Natera. Today, we are going to talk about some experiences I've had with food critics, what it was like to be cooking for food critics, what the process is in the kitchen, what's going through my mind, the chaos that ensues, what were some of the things that I did to hopefully leverage things in my favor. But nonetheless, I know a lot of people are interested in that. A lot of people wonder what it's like to deal with food critics. So today, in today's episode, we're going to get into all of that. So I want to go back to really my first experience with a food critic. I was a chef at a resort in Coachella, Indian Wells, California. And that was really the first time that I had really been written about, had my name in the newspaper, and it was a, it was a different feeling. There's a lot of stress that goes with that. There's a lot of source of pride that goes with it. If, if they wrote nicely about you, you have this immense sense of pride. You, you kind of stick your chest out. You you puff up a little bit. I didn't get written about much in California, but it was just my first introduction to it. So I had an idea for it. Fast forward a couple of years later, and I am the chef at the Pyramid Restaurant inside the Fairmont Hotel in Dallas, Texas. And now for those people that don't know, the Pyramid Restaurant for many years in Dallas was like an iconic restaurant. There's three classic French iconic restaurants in Dallas that have been around forever. And that is the Mansion on Turtle Creek, the French Room, and the Pyramid Restaurant. And so it really didn't matter who was the chef at any of those places. If you were the chef there, you were going to get written about and most likely a food critic would come in. So initially, right away, I met with my PR manager and they explained to me, hey, we're doing a press release. We're announcing that you're the new chef, but you need to be prepared because most likely you're going to get a visit from the food critics from the Dallas Morning News and all the other food publications and people that are reviewing restaurants at that time. Actually, before we get started, I want to go back and clarify something. I said the mansion on Turtle Creek was a French restaurant. It indeed is not a French restaurant. When Bruno Dabion was there as the executive chef, they were doing French food. But when Dean Fearing was the chef there, they were doing Southwest cuisine. So it, it wasn't always a French restaurant. I think a lot of that is determined by who is the chef. They've just always been known as that fine dining establishment within Dallas. So now fast forward. The current food critic at the time from the Dallas Morning News was Leslie Brenner, and she had a fierce reputation for being really harsh on chefs. And from what I remember, I think she had just come from working at the Los Angeles Times, if I'm correct, and I might be wrong on that. But she had a very specific palate. She had very specific expectations for restaurants. And at the time, she was the kingmaker. And what I mean by that is if she liked you, you were on top, you were going to be a household name in Dallas and the chef community. So she was the king ma maker. So I was a little bit nervous that she was going to come in. Fortunately for me, my sommelier at the time, Hunter Hammett, shout out to Hunter. He had waited on her and knew who she was because he had worked previously at Fairings under Dean Fairing. So he had recognized her and there was pictures floating around of her at the time because she was really trying to be incognito, but she had written a book and I believe her photograph was floating around from that book. So every single chef and every single server in the restaurant had her photograph inside their wallet. I made it a standard. Okay. If she shows up, everyone needs to know who she is. Now she was going in, you know, under fake names. So she was never going to make the reservation as Leslie Brenner. She was going to make the reservation as, you know, Mary Sue or whatever. Everyone knew what she looked like, and they all knew as soon as she comes in, they needed to alert the kitchen. Now, in the culinary team, we were on high alert. We always wanted to know, okay, if she comes in, what is the plan? And we had a mitigation plan in place, and that was, if I happen to be off, because the food critics are smart, they're going to try and go on a Sunday when the, when the head chef is usually off. Everyone knew, if I am off, you call me. As soon as you recognize her, you call me. I'm going to drop everything and come to the restaurant so I could make sure that service goes smoothly and that the food is correct. So we knew that. The other thing that we knew is that once we recognized her, that the tables around where she was sitting, if no one was sitting there at the time, we were going to mark those tables with people that we knew. 
for example, she's sitting at a table, the table next to her, we were going to call our friend and say, you're sitting right next to her so you can eavesdrop on everything that she's saying and you're going to text us a play-by-play. We, we already had people planted in the restaurant that were going to sit next to her and uh, send us the play-by-play. So anyway, long story short, she shows up to the restaurant and Hunter recognizes her right away. I happen to be in the restaurant at the time. I'm in the kitchen and they alert me. They say, hey, FYI, food critic is in at this table. Boom. Now we know. We go on high alert and this is a tense situation in the kitchen. This is really my first experience with the food critics. I'm nervous. I want to make sure that she's happy with our food. And at the time, so this is really pre-Instagram and social media and all that. I had been working in California and food trends back then were much quicker on the coasts than they were in Texas. So people would always say, oh, California is five to 10 years ahead on food trends than Dallas, Texas. So having just come from California and having been the chef of one of the better restaurants in the city and getting recognition there. I felt that even though I wasn't top of the food chain in California, I could take that food and bring it to Dallas and I'd be five years ahead of everyone else. So I felt like it was easy to get noticed in Dallas at the time because they were still a little bit behind and I'm not knocking anyone, but it's the truth. They were a little bit behind the times and I could do my old shit from California and people would be like, oh my God, I've never seen this before because they hadn't. So now she's in the dining room and everything's going well. I go touch the table because obviously I didn't just touch her table because I had to not know who she was. So I touched other tables and just pretended like, oh, hi, how are you? And I think I was delivering a souffle or something. And she started talking, oh, are you the chef? Blah, blah, blah. And I said, yes, we happened to have a rooftop garden at the time. So I was like, oh, would you like a tour of the garden? I schmoozed her and her husband. I don't remember who else was there. And I gave him a tour of the garden. She was asking a lot of questions. Now I know she's the food critic. I'm not sure if she is aware that I know. But nonetheless, I'm playing the part. I'm calling her by her fake name, even though I know it's a fake name. I'm playing the game. Long story short, she came in a couple of times. I want to say she came in once or twice. And everything went well where I got a great review. Now, funny story. On one of those visits where she came in, it was a complete disaster. We had run out of pasta. And no one said anything. So the pasta was 86 and we forgot to tell the service team. And she happened to order the pasta. So it's like one of those, oh shit moments. What do we do? And so the order is in. So there's first, second, third course. The pasta, I believe, was on the second course. And I'm freaking out because one of the sous chefs at the Times comes up to me and says, chef, we're out of pasta. And she's ordered it. So what the f- do we do? So <laughs> I'm panicking. I'm yelling at one of the cooks. You better hurry up and make that pasta and it better be cooked. So she's scrambling over there, making pasta dough, rolling it through the machine. We get it done. I don't, I, to this day, I don't know how we got it done, but by the time the pasta course was fired, we made pasta somehow. Divine intervention came in and made the pasta. And like I said, we had a great review and it was interesting because subsequently after that, we got a four-star review. I was recognized by the Dallas Morning News as one of the best chefs by the Dallas Morning News. And that was 2011 and 2012, I believe. So now within the city, I'm getting a lot of press. So not just from the Dallas Morning News, but from Dallas Modern Luxury, D Magazine. I've now ascended to the top of the food chain within the chef community and that market. So things are changing for me. Now I'm a hot commodity. People are writing about me. Other chefs are stealing my ideas. People are watching what we're doing. Young chefs want to work for me. I have a line out the door of people that want to work for me now. So my life has completely changed at this point. So what do you do when you're successful? By the way, if you're listening to this, remember this advice. What do you do when you're successful? You capitalize on your success and you double down. So I had an opportunity to go be the chef partner of some restaurants in Dallas. And lo and behold, here we got the food critic back in. and. I don't remember exactly what the rule was, like they wouldn't review you for six weeks or whatever, but I remember early on, it was a tough go round because I had to completely turn over the kitchen staff because that's just the way restaurants are. New chef comes in, most people start quitting because they were loyal to the old chef, they don't like change, et cetera. So I turned over a significant portion of my staff. In addition to that, I have to train new staff on a new style of food. So 
it's slow to go from what you were doing at the previous restaurant in terms of level of cuisine to now the new place doing the exact same levels. But you got to take some steps to get there. But I didn't really have time because the expectation is you're a four-star chef. You're two years consecutive in the best chef Dallas. We expect you to perform at the highest level. And I didn't really have enough time to get the kitchen to where I needed it to get to. And lo and behold, here comes the food critics. I thought we had a decent night. I thought we were performing. We used to brine our duck with pink curing salt and a lot of other things. But anyway, in the review, I'll never forget this. She wrote that the duck had the taste and texture of a hot dog. I'm assuming it was because of the pink curing salts, but it, it didn't have the taste of a hot dog. It tasted like duck. But anyway, she beat me up a little bit. And uh, th so I went from a four-star chef to a three-star chef. And I, I got to admit, that was like a huge blow to the ego. So it's like, how are we going to push to four stars? That That's where we wanted to get to. And I'll tell you another thing that was funny in the kitchen. So we have a rule when a food critic came in. And I remember watching the movie Burnt. And he screams this out. He's like, there always needs to be two portions of everything. So you got to cook two of everything. The reason you would do that is because in case you mess one up, like let's just say you're cooking a steak. Let's say your steak is a little bit over. You're going to have another steak ready to go. Um, so if you got to switch it out, like the chef sees it, hey, it's supposed to be medium rare. You cooked it medium. Great. We have the backup one that's slightly undercooked that we could get it to where it needs to be. So this time she happened to have ordered a steak. And of course, I planted a person next to her table. We're getting the text. In this particular restaurant, I had mirrors. So I was able to watch her the entire time and see what she was doing, what she was eating. And I'm getting play by play from my friend that's sitting next to her, what she's eating, what she's saying about the food, blah, blah, blah. And by the way, it's a stressful day in the kitchen. We're busy. So food comes back and we have an expression. You want to see the food coming and going. And what that means is that is a very important person in the restaurant. I am expecting every plate going and I'm expecting every plate coming back. So she ordered the steak. She sends the steak back. I want to verify that the steak is cooked. And by the way, I don't mean she sent it back to get cooked differently. Like she's done eating. She wanted it to go, which I didn't know. So the server brings the steak back, has it on a plate. Me and the sous chef go back there to check the steak. We cut into it. So this is her eaten steak, right? She took a piece out of it. We cut into it. We're not going to eat it. We just kind of want to look and make sure it's cooked correctly because this is the first time, you know, we're seeing inside the steak. So we look at it. We're dicing it up. We're looking to make sure it's perfect. And the server comes back and he says, that's supposed to be to go. Now we're like, oh shit, we just cut into her steak and it was supposed to be to go. What do we do now? Thank God we had the backup second cook steak. So we cut it like in the same area that she had taken a bite out of it and made it look like it was the original one, but that was a tense situation. Funny story nonetheless. Long story short, new review comes out. It's not as great as the first one. Of course, that's tough on the team. And I, I think what people don't realize is every chef is looking for a little bit of that recognition, especially when you're climbing up the ladder and, and your restaurant and your reputation lives and dies off what they're writing about you in the paper. And for people that don't understand this, let me explain to you what it's like. Like you might get a review from your boss. You sit down and you get a good or a bad review. Or at home, when you were a kid, you get your report card. Well, that's between you, the teacher, your parents, or you and your boss, right? The difference when you're being written about in the paper is, number one, you didn't ask to be written about in the paper. And it's like they're reading your employee review or your, your report card out loud for everyone in the community to see. And it's like, shit. When it's great, it's like, Everyone, everyone loves being the hammer, but no one likes being the nail. It's great when you're on top. It's not so great when, when they're writing poorly about you. Obviously that felt like a, it was nonetheless, it was disappointing. Long story short, it was disappointing to get a bad review. Now we've changed concepts. We're in a different restaurant. We have a restaurant downstairs. We have a restaurant upstairs. She comes in again. We get a bad review again, and it's like, I'm having a bad week. She shows up at the wrong time. She shows up on a Sunday. I'm working service. I actually thought the food went well. I was really surprised that she gave us a bad review because I thought this restaurant was better than the one she gave three stars. 
But anyway, long story short, we get a bad review and now I'm devastated because it's like, I went from being a four-star chef and it's like every review after that seemed to only go downhill. Like I said, it's great when you're on top, but when you're on top and if you're not, uh, if you're not careful, you could quickly fall to the bottom. So it was a difficult time for me to process because a lot of people were saying, oh, did he lose it? He's not as good as he used to be, you know, blah, blah, blah. And it was one of these tough situations. So here's what's really interesting about this time is, so the day that I get the bad review from her in the paper, you know, we're all bummed out. And uh, a couple of, of my friends from the restaurant decided, well, let's go out drinking. And we went to Casa Rubia at the time. Chef Omar Flores had a restaurant called Casa Rubia. And Omar's a friend. I love Omar. We're both from the same hometown. And I want to go eat his food. I want to go eat at his restaurant. And so I'm there with the ownership. And lo and behold, there's the food critic and like a couple of tables down from, from where we're sitting. And I thought, well, isn't that a coincidence? Here I'm having like, she probably doesn't realize what a bad day I'm having. And there she is. You just destroyed my reputation in the paper. And oh, we happen to show up at the same restaurant. Anyway, that's neither here nor there. It did suck. But I just thought that was funny. Long story, but I go through a little bit of sadness, like a lot of chefs do. You know, when you're on top, you love it. When you're on bottom, it sucks. And I'm, I'm definitely going through a funk. And uh, I, th I think some of my friends notice that I'm going through a funk. But I'll share this story, and I'll, I'll keep it short. But Chef John Tazar, who you know was a, a pretty well-known, famous chef in, in, in Dallas, and he has uh, other restaurants and some Ritz Carltons across the country, but he's a great chef. He's been on Top Chef. He used to work with Anthony Bourdain. He's a chef's chef and he gets it. Well, anyway, I'm down in the dumps. He happens to show up out of the blue. Like I, I didn't invite him. He just happened to show up with another friend of mine and they came into the restaurant and I'll never forget this because it was great advice. He called me up and he said, Hey, let's go upstairs and have a drink. So the three of us, we went upstairs and had a drink. And uh, he says, look, I know you're down in the dumps. I know you just got a bad review, but let me tell you something. I've gotten lots of bad reviews and I'm still here. And you're still young in your career. You have plenty of opportunity to rise and fall and rise and fall again. Hey, be sad tonight, have some drinks, but tomorrow get back after it. And it was what I needed to hear at the moment, especially from a chef that was older and wiser than me that I respected. When you're dealing with food critics, I think it's important that you have a plan. Know what you're supposed to do. Know who those food critics are. Maybe the photos are posted on the wall or whatever. Do what you do. Be present. But they're going to write what they write, whether it's good, whether it's bad. Hopefully it's good because obviously good compounds. But if it's bad, remember this. It's just one person's opinion about you and it doesn't define who you are. You need to learn from it, pick yourself back up and get back after it. So anyway, that's all for today's rant. Chefs, thank you so much. If you want to support the podcast, you could buy the book Chef's PSA. It's available on Amazon. It's also available on Audible and iTunes, the audio version of it. And you could follow along at Chef's PSA on Instagram and Chef's PSA on Twitter. Anyway, thank you all very much and see you next time.